Hey guys, welcome back to my YouTube channel. Uh, I'm posting after a really long time, but I am back with a bang. And this has been long overdue with Professor Pascal Wallish, who is a professor at NYU. And uh, I, so basically, I don't know how, but then he got to know about my YouTube channel. And then I had also attended a lot of his talks or um, sessions at various uh, occasions. And he's a great speaker. And I thought that like, I should totally get him on my podcast so that he can share his experiences and his knowledge with the entire YouTube community. Mm -hmm. So uh, without any further ado, let's uh, dive deep into the episode. And before that, I would also like to thank my friends, uh, Kevna, Eugenia, and Max for helping me come up with all these questions. I really appreciate it. And now without further ado, let's get straight into the video. And if you haven't subscribed to my channel, please do that. Professor Pascal, so uh, you are one of the most beloved professors at NYU. I think like everybody knows about you. But then for mm -hmm. my viewers who, uh, who, are, who are seeing you for the first time, would you like to give a quick introduction about yourself? Uh, like where are you from? Mm -hmm. What impressed you the most? And your journey to where you are today? Okay, great. Thank, well, first of all, thank you for having me on the podcast, or the channel. Um, thank you for doing this. Um, and... Uh, yeah, so let's see. Uh, so maybe I should start by saying that uh, you're saying like introduce yourself. Like I don't know. So I I don't know what I am. Unclear yet. I'm trying to figure it out. But people call me Pascal. So you know, just calling Pascal. <laughs> a lot of people do. Um, but yeah, I think you're right. Uh, it's probably a good idea to introduce yourself by like, um, you know, your journey. Although, you know what I just realized as you were speaking, I was like, you know, you know how before talks there was like um, always an introduction, right? Mm -hmm. And that never really made sense to me because, you know, if you if if you're someone worth listening to, you don't need an introduction. You know, you already know who the person is, and if you need one, like why should everyone listen to it? Anyway, let me try. So my journey mm -hmm. is: I was born and raised in Germany. I got my undergrad degree in Germany. I mean, this is like really like very briefly uh, the brief outline. Then I mm -hmm. uh, moved to the U.S. I was I'm an immigrant. Mm -hmm. How about that? Uh, English. I lost my view as an immigrant, so. They, this is I'm going to be super relatable. And uh, English as a second language um, person. Uh, first generation college. First generation college. Wow. Now it's true. It's true. Uh, and uh, anyway, so I went to the University of Chicago, mm -hmm. where, I, where I got my PhD. Uh, and then I moved to uh, New York. Um, to actually, first to the Central Center for Neuro Neural Science, not, not data science. That didn't exist mm -hmm. back then. Center for Neuroscience, where I did my postdoctoral studies. And then uh, after that, I joined uh, the Department of Psychology at NYU. So I switched from neuroscience to psychology then. And then just recently, during the coronavirus, I switched mm -hmm. from, from the Department of Psychology to the Department of, through the Center for, Neuro, for Data Science, sorry. And that is really the very rough outline of like my journey. So maybe from the journey, people can like kind of infer like, what I'm about, but again, it's a, it's an ongoing process. Uh, we're like mm -hmm. in the process of being and becoming, and as you know, like if Heidegger, what in being is in being, it's unclear. We'll find out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, and like for all of all my viewers who are not from NYU or not from like psychology or the data science department, mm -hmm. so uh, Professor Pascal is like very popular, and then almost every student from undergrad or masters knows him. And recently, he also won the Teaching Innovation Award at mm -hmm. NYU. And okay. I think that like every student you've taught will attest to the fact that you truly deserve this award. And also like, uh, I can personally say that like, even after uh, the course finished, we were still in touch and then we were chatting and then you were like uh, mentoring me. So uh, tr uh, truly appreciate it. And I think that like, you have a very unique uh, teaching style. Mm -hmm. So on this note, like wh uh, what do you think attracts like students to your lectures and uh, why do you have such a high attendance rate and what makes your lectures so engaging uh, like what's your motivation or inspiration behind that particular pedagogy that you have all right well first of all thank you for saying that uh, that's very uh, that's very kind of you um uh, because you know as you know if you hear that someone won an award you don't want the first question be like for what or, or like why you want, <laughs> you, want, you want to feel like that's yeah that makes sense you know so i'm glad you feel that way um, in terms of like what I think is going on, um, so basically the, the underlying philosophy 
and maybe I should send you my teaching philosophy. I actually have one. So when you mm -hmm. want to become a professor, you have to write like, a teaching philosophy. And, and most people, frankly, just write that because they have to write that for the application. But I actually okay. have, a, have a teaching philosophy. And I'm happy to share it with you. Maybe you can put it mm -hmm. in the, uh, in the uh, you know, show notes or something. Description? Yeah, sure. Thanks. But so briefly, the, the, the underlying philosophy is, and maybe that's where my background in psychology comes in, is that you cannot or should not, if you want to make an impact, take the, odd, the attention of your audience for uh, granted. You basically have to be engaging. I don't have to tell you that as a YouTuber. You have to be engaging <laughs> or try to be engaging to engage people. So let me give you a specific example from... Um, from, from data science. So in other mm -hmm. words, the, the, the material does not speak for itself. So let me give you an example, a specific right. example. So the way most people teach, say, probability, mm -hmm. and the way I learned probability when I was a student was like, professor shows up, teaches you about the, you know, axioms of probability by Kolmogorov, which are fine. Mm -hmm. They're true as far as I can, I mean, you know, it's fine if they start somewhere. But then they use examples from like coins, cards, dice, and urns. Now, let me ask something, Sabesh. Have you mm -hmm. ever wondered where a coin is fair? Have you ever wondered that? I've assumed it to be true always. Uh -huh. you, but you have never wondered that, yes? No, yeah. Or, you know, throwing dice or anything like that. So unless you're cards, so unless you're like a pathological gambler, these examples yeah. are not really relevant, frankly. Now, right. I understand why people do it, okay? Why people use dice, coins, cards, or urns in the examples. The sample space is well known, yes. There's historical reasons. So, for instance, Pascal, not no relation, Blaise mm -hmm. Pascal, developed probability theory, analyzing games of chance, yes, mm -hmm. card, card specifically. But for most people today, those things are not relevant. Like, they, you know, they don't wonder about these things. Do you? I mean, do you? So, so most really, people yeah. mm -hmm. just do that because that's, about how, that's how they were taught. There's historical reasons. The sample space is well known. And, you know, whatever, right? But... Would you agree that those are not the most inspiring examples by which you can teach probability? I mean, right? I mean, it's it's it's, mm -hmm. it's canon, but no one cares, right? right. So, yeah. so what I use what I use in my in my probability lecture is like you know examples from real life. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, you want to you know get home. What is the probability that you're going to make it uh, in some time? Uh, because say the traffic lights. Have a certain schedule so you can calculate that or mm -hmm. I mean, that's not the best example but it's, that's one example so my point is you want to use relevant examples from like real life what is the probability that you're that someone's cheating on you or what's the probability that uh you know that the company is going to make it for the end of the year certain assumptions mm -hmm. uh, so anyway what i'm saying is if probability is such a great way to quantify uncertainty why not <laughs> quantify uncertainty in a way that is actually that people actually care about if that makes sense right so, uh, and so in other words, to make a long story short, the material mm -hmm. has to be, um, what should we call it, like rigorous. So you can't just be like, mm -hmm. you know, tell people about your cats or something like that. It has to be relevant, rigorous, but mm -hmm. also clear. And, and so, um, so this is, um, I call this track, T-R-E-C. Okay. So the idea is it has to be true. So you, have, you can't mm -hmm. be like technically, uh, you know, you know, crazy or like make stuff up. But also has to be right. relevant. That's the R, and E mm -hmm. is engaging. You have to make. If, by the way, you don't have to do this. But if you care for your students to like actually learn something, mm -hmm. you have to make it engaging. That's the E. Makes and then sense. other stuff is like clear and you know. But anyway, so 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 that's my that, that's an explicit teaching philosophy. So mm -hmm. there's no there's no it's not random. Like it's not like an accident. So the, the classes are deliberately designed to have that effect uh, and. You know, it's a lot of work. You don't have to do that. I mean, you <laughs> definitely you know, get paid the same money as a professor if you make your <laughs> classes super engaging or completely mm -hmm. not um, as long as I mean, there's no, it's no, there's no, there's makes no difference. So actually, so the incentive scheme is for people for professors to put in the least effort. Uh, I totally agree with the track which you mentioned, and I think like R is the most important link because relevant. like if it's uh, relevant, then mm -hmm. it becomes engaging, exactly. and if it's engaging and relevant then exactly. there's a greater chance of it becoming clear because people yes. will try yeah so it's like a domino effect yeah you got yeah, it. that got totally it. makes sense so so yeah so what i'm saying is but for some reason again i don't want to like be self congratulatory but as you know uh, most of my professors didn't do that and most mm -hmm. of uh, most professors i'm not a secret there's no like i said there's no incentives this approach is not incentivized if you just right. 
put in the bare minimum no one like there's no there's no penalty if that makes sense mm-hmm. yeah that's a great piece of advice like it can be applied even in professional lives when you're giving a presentation so i think like not only for teaching like for any general like presentation that's a great uh, tip i guess yeah, but don't so, drop but don't drop the t so 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 a lot of people yeah. are, like on the ted <laughs> circuit or, or like the self help circuit are like yeah you know look at me how great i am no it has to be true it has to be true and that's frankly, the foundation I would actually like to add a second R like rigorous you know it, ha- it still has to be rigorous you can't just be fluffy show people like you know some right. memes, some memes like it has to be rigorous still yeah that makes sense that totally makes sense so it's like trek so trek. yeah makes yes. sense yeah thanks a lot for the great answer Thank and you. uh now moving on like I, i i'm personally curious to know that how did you get into the field of like psychology and mm-hmm. then move to data science I see. to what you're currently doing and what you're currently doing is kind of like sits at the boundary of like three exciting fields which is like psychology mm-hmm. data science and a bit of neuroscience as well no you're so, right um, can you talk about it please i i can uh and maybe that will motivate my journey a little bit so the bottom line is mm-hmm. this in life you're always facing this explore exploit trade off the idea mm-hmm. is you know like how much of the space of the options are out there are you exploring versus how much are you like really going for it once you found something that you you know like and you're good at and all of that and in my experience particularly being from germany where there is no undergrad to speak of so you 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 pick a career right after high school say mm-hmm. let's say you want to go to in, in germany let's say you want to go study say psychology you're studying mm-hmm. psychology like there's no liberal arts there's no outer field or I medicine think. you go right to medical school or law or something like that but mm-hmm. my question to you would be like how would you know what that's like unless you try it first if it makes sense definitely yeah that's true so i've always been mindful of that even before i learned formally about the explore 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 trade off and i mm-hmm. think people need to explore more because most people are biased towards just you know i don't know your parents are doing it so you're going to do it or something like that or your mm-hmm. friend liked it so you're going to do it um and that's fine by the way as a heuristic i'm just saying that i personally have always been more like um on the explore side. So like we expect specific specific examples. So in Germany, mm-hmm. as I said, there is no undergrad to speak of, but in the last two years of high school, which when I was there, high school is longer, you do have majors. Mm-hmm. And I was a, I was a math major and physics major, double major, and I don't know how to say this, but what I realized from doing that is that I do not want to do this professionally for for forever. Mm-hmm. But let me give you an idea why. Um both of these fields seem to be extremely mature and extremely like complete if that makes sense mm-hmm. and that doesn't mean that there's not things still to figure out in physics and math however it would take an unbelievable effort in both of these fields to make any further advance and mm-hmm. in all modesty i think i was right about this so i left these fields 25 years ago mm-hmm. and i don't think i was wrong about this so if you look at the hot topics in physics 25 years ago and now dark matter is still as dark as it was then it's is a mystery mm-hmm. and frankly right. i believe it's kind of a kludge like it makes no sense this whole concept mm-hmm. of dark matter makes no sense uh but there's no been no pro- no progress string theory is untestable uh mm-hmm. and, and it bothers me frankly like it's more like a religion than a scientific mm-hmm. you know theory I, i understand how beautiful it is but it's not what well, it's not science like how are you going to test it and then the you know uh standard theory we have now built much more powerful accelerators but to my knowledge there's been no new particles uh been shown or even challenged the standard model so where's the mm-hmm. progress so i've been kind of spinning our wheels that doesn't mean that there's no progress to be made you know fusion fusion energy and stuff like that but it would take a herculean effort to make this progress and the average you know physics papers in like in high energy physics is not like 500,000 offers you know and there is some small thing i mean i don't want to call it small but there is some marginal progress you know first mm-hmm. but it's mostly, it's mostly confirmatory like images of black holes that we thought they were there or confirmation mm-hmm. of higgs bones bosons that we thought what was there but where's the where's the true transformation progress you have to understand physics went through a revolution in the 20th century there's transformation actually it's multiple ones there's transformation right. in the 21st century it's been mostly confirmatory so far and mm-hmm. i don't mean that we can't make true progress but it's going to i don't even know what it's going to take uh, i don't see it mm-hmm. so much bigger colliders much more much higher energies and that's going to be really hard and that was clear to me 25 years ago 
So I decided to go into a field that's much more like, I don't know how to say this, uh, where there's still much more like opportunity to make, to make, um, to explore. Yes. And to make like transformational contributions, like, uh, to the field, true discoveries. Sure. How about that? True discoveries and, and psychology is on, on that level. You can make true discoveries. And since right. you asked about neuroscience, psychology, and data science, frankly, data science, or like you could say, how is psychology even relevant to da the data science you're doing now? Frankly, mm -hmm. it is. Uh, so for instance, this, um, like if you look at neural networks, mm -hmm. that's basically like, you know, that's very informed by neuroscience. Or if you look at reinforcement learning, that is very yeah. informed by psychology. So, so I think yeah. these, these fields are not as far away as you think. Uh, or, or if you look at um, uh, the other way around, like, so modern psychology and neuroscience, you can leverage data science methods to, to do, you know, those fields. So, so mm -hmm. I don't really see, see it as like, like I switched, it's more like I integrated these fields in my own personal. Makes sense. Sorry. Yeah, I agree. And yeah, um, these are like definitely interlinked. And uh, you spoke about explore and exploit earlier when you were sharing about your journey. So that's mm -hmm. like reinforcement learning 101 for beginners. Yes. <laughs> um, and like based on uh, what you just said, I think like uh, you wanted, uh, based on like uh, what I know about you so far, I think you are more of like an analytical person for sure, because you are a data scientist, but you are also more of a creative person. Oh, so like psychology and data science, these fields probably like uh, let you explore those skill sets. Exactly. Um, whereas like, I think like for physics and math, which are like more mature fields, uh, mm -hmm. the law of diminishing efforts is uh, happening like already much progress has been made so like okay. even though if you make like huge take in huge efforts the output is going to be like uh, marginal not that, that is, much yeah. that is exactly right like, if you look at the 20th century so for instance like you have like mm -hmm. von Neumann right I mean yeah. you have these like major geniuses right that did a lot of really good work how are you going to build on that right I mean it's going to yeah. be really hard right so, so yes, I mean, you have to basically find your niche where like, where can I make my contribution? You know, I see. That's a great career tip for all those who are lost. Like, where can you make your contribution? That will help you find your passion, like what you're passionate about. That's exactly. a great tip. And that is why I'm particularly excited about these young fields like neuroscience and mm -hmm. data science. Because frankly, when I started as an undergrad, neuroscience was not, not available. And when I started uh, grad school, data science wasn't, didn't exist. So, right. so, so in a way, I'm very excited about these young fields where you can make a real, in my opinion, you can make still mm -hmm. a, a genuine contribution. Yes. Yeah, that makes sense. And then we spoke about like these fields are like very interlinked today. And yes. there's a thin boundary between these fields or professions that were traditionally considered to be very distinct. Yes. Uh, so on this note, like uh, I read a bit about the fox versus hedgehog approach, mm -hmm. and I would like you to share a bit more about it and maybe tell us more about the Fox Lab at NYU. Very good. So, so Isaiah Berlin had a mm -hmm. classification problem or a categorization problem. He thought there is two kinds of people, foxes and hedgehogs, yes? And mm -hmm. the idea, and it's just about intellectual style. So the hedgehog style, they're like, these people do like one thing and they're comfortable doing that. And it's an important thing and they can make their living doing that one thing. It's like one perspective mm -hmm. of the world. The Fox style is kind of like you're integrating many different thoughts and perspectives and you try to integrate different fields and um and this might be literally like a uh what should i call it a like personal like preference like this might be like unclear you know if it's genetic or nature or nurture any of like that biology or social conditioning but it seems mm -hmm. to be that people have a clear preference like for one or the other by the way not all people but in the extremes so i am an extreme fox so i mm -hmm. like to, like you know integrate perspectives on many fields and by the way this is not um, risk-free. The danger of being a fox is you dabble in all of these things, but you never like really like make any contribution because you're not, you know, you're not able to do that. You know what I'm saying? So, so it is in a way um, more straightforward in a way to be the hedgehog because you know you learn the methods of one field, you mm -hmm. do that, you practice those, you do that well, you make connections in that field. Everybody knows you read the literature, and you make a you make one big contribution at one field and that seems very doable, yes. The big thing mm -hmm. of the box approach is you try to integrate these things, but there's nothing to integrate. And so you have nothing. So, right. so in a way, in terms of like an incentive perspective, academia in particular incentivizes the uh, hedgehog approach, you know. You mm -hmm. expect to be an expert in one field, 
right. you make a contribution in one field and you get grants in one field and you have an appointment in one field. And so the whole system is geared towards that. But unfortunately, I can't do that. So I mm-hmm. said, you know, I leverage my academic freedom to implement the Fox approach anyway and to signal that we call our whole lab that, the Fox lab. Mm-hmm. So in the Fox lab, we do just that. We study uh, questions usually from neuroscience and psychology, but we mm-hmm. use data science methods to like um, tackle them. And we are, are working explicitly in an interdisciplinary fashion. I see. Yeah, that's that's a really interesting uh, venture. And like the job market at this moment in yes. 2022 uh, versus the job market, let's say 25 years ago okay. when you were just a fresh graduate. So how different is it and which approach suits the job market uh, right now? Uh, is it the Fox approach or the hedgehog or a combination of both? Um, so that's a great question. Uh, and I'm, I'm tr- see, I trying to say something that is true, but not some gross generality. So first of all, mm-hmm. one approach is not superior to the other one. Like, I mean, some mm-hmm. of my best friends are hedgehogs. So, so I'm not saying the Fox approach is better. It's mm-hmm. just my advice would be, find the approach that actually suits your personality and then go with that. Uh, in terms of this job market, I wouldn't worry too much about that because that's always in flux, okay? Uh, sure. uh, and I think there's a niche for both. Uh, so for mm-hmm. instance, like uh, there's always gonna be a, let's say you are a pro software engineer. There's always gonna be a market for that, right? Um, mm-hmm. the, and the danger of the, the Fox approach is if you don't do that well, you have nothing. So it's much more, yeah. it's, it's much more nonlinear. Or people say, well, he's a, you know, master of none, like he's like just like <laughs> a dilettante in all of these fields. So mm-hmm. I would say that um, maybe maybe as, a, as an advice for a beginner, don't be a fox to begin with. Start with one field and then build from there. So you have something to fall back on if the f- real fox thing doesn't work out. Because otherwise you have nothing. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. Yeah, that's a great tip. I kind of like totally like it and yeah. would definitely love to follow in my life as well. That's, that's yeah. a great tip. Love it. And uh, m- uh, moving on, uh, to a different topic now. So mm-hmm. what's the most exciting or challenging project that you've worked on so far? Great question. However, without hedging on this, I want to be clear that um, um, I don't really think of it like that. What I mean by that is mm-hmm. all of my projects are like that because if, I don't, if I'm not really excited, I don't do them, if that makes sense. So one of the big advantages that being in academia allows me to do is instead of mm-hmm. someone telling me yeah, yo, you have to work on this. I know we don't really believe it, but we're really getting paid really well to do it. Mm-hmm. I don't do any of that. I don't do a project if I'm not really excited about it. But let me give you some, some example of things that we're working mm-hmm. on right now that actually kind of like implement this Fox uh, style. And mm-hmm. um, yeah, so just some examples. So maybe, okay. two, maybe two examples. Um, but to be clear, unless I'm really excited, I don't even do the project, if that makes sense. So, that's so, weird. You're highly selective. Mm-hmm. So that's, yeah, so that's why, like, it's so exactly. So it's like a selective, so you call it a bias problem. Like, there's a very specific <laughs> range. So that's why I don't mm-hmm. really, 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 really judge, but the most exciting one, because the projects live in a, like, multidimensional space. Some of them, mm-hmm. some of them might be more challenging, maybe some of them more interesting, some of them might have a higher impact if they work. But some, so to, to illustrate um, maybe the Fox, Fox approach, if something that's more, psychology based and something more data science based. So one example is, as you know, I did this um, project on the dress, like this dress is black and blue and yeah. white, and gold, white and gold. And that actually okay. exemplifies the Fox approach well. Let me give, tell you why. To solve the riddle of why some people see the dress black and blue and others see it mm-hmm. white and gold, you have to be a Fox because the answer is not in any particular field, but it integrates perspectives from many fields because what you have to know to solve that question. I don't want to get too far afield of how we solved it. You can put mm-hmm. the paper in the show notes, I guess. But you sure. have to understand color vision well, co- how color perception, specifically mm-hmm. color constancy, because that's, that's the mechanism by which this works. Then you have to understand uh, the idea of chronotypes well. So basically you have to understand sleep patterns well and chronotypes mm-hmm. and how chronotypes might inform might inform, um, what should I call it? Um, might inform uh, perception. Color perception. Oh, yeah. Color, 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 yeah, color priors, which brings me to the next point. Mm-hmm. If there's an Bayesian priors well enough to, to make them work and their role in perception, the last thing is you have to understand 
data science and like data well enough to actually solve it. So, so, so we, mm -hmm. you know, we uh, got data from 13,000 people. We built a classifier. So that's where like the statistics and data science comes in. And we, we asked them things that make sense from a Bayesian prior perspective. And the things we asked them were informed by uh, color perception, specifically uh, color constancy and chronotypes. And then, so that's mm -hmm. not random, you know, so you have to integrate these five different um, backgrounds yeah. of fields to solve it. Right. And luckily I had background, I mean, I'd worked in all five of these fields before, so I, so we could do it. Yes. I see. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. Yeah. That's and, and, and so something else, so that's something we did. Something we're working mm -hmm. on right now is uh, psychopathy detection. Uh, I don't okay. want to go too, 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 too deep into what a psychopath is, but basically the, the, uh, what people think it's like an ex murderer, but it's actually not true. Most of them are not violent. Mm -hmm. It's just very shameless. They're like, they're like taking mm -hmm. advantage of people. They, you know, mm -hmm. cut corners. They have no empathy or at least mm -hmm. I don't know, you know, most of them, yeah, I, I don't want to be too absolute, absolute about this, but they have mm -hmm. problems with empathy and ethics and more morals and shame and they take advantage of you. So we have to like mm -hmm. find because they are in the habit of destroying great companies. And so, mm -hmm. so we are using like machine learning methods to find them and we use psychology and neuroscience to like detect them. So that's what we do. Well, right now. yeah, that's and a pretty interesting project. And the reason I'm excited about that is because we need to protect the innocent because most mm -hmm. people think most people are not psychopaths. So I mm -hmm. think, well, everybody's just kind of like a nice person. False but positives are not at all accepted here. <laughs> it's, you know, so that's a problem. You have to be very careful with false mm -hmm. positives because you don't want to right. stick with somebody as a psychopath if you're not. But the other yeah. thing is also true. Most people like you, Savesh, are nice people, kind people. Thank you. <laughs> it's true. It's, it's obvious. So from a psychology perspective, you will assume that everybody else is, is like you. I have, bad, I have bad news for you. No, they're not. <laughs> And they will take advantage, take advantage of you without a second thought. And they will make you suffer without worrying about it. And so to protect people like you, we have to find them. <laughs> Otherwise, they will take advantage of you. And, and I'm, I'm not just saying that. I've seen this sadly from personal experience. So, but they will mm -hmm. not just come to you and be like, yeah, look at me. I'm a psychopath. They, they're actually trying, <laughs> to, trying to hide. So you have to find them like with machine learning methods. But you are right. We are mindful of the ethical implications mm -hmm. and stigma and all that. So we don't want to like... You know, you have to be careful. False. Basically, you're right. right. False problems are not acceptable at all. Mm -hmm. you're yeah. right. Very hard machine learning problem to solve here. Yeah. So another aspect got got added to this ethical data science or ethics in AI. Mm -hmm. We are talking about the interdisciplinary. So ethics is like one upcoming. Very important. Um, yeah, very, very important. important thing. Right. Yeah, that was uh, great to know. And uh, since you teach uh, the intro to data mm -hmm. science course for undergrads, as well as the master students at NYU, okay. you may come across like students from various backgrounds, like exactly. uh, with a spectrum of experience in data science. Mm -hmm. uh, so what are your tips for aspiring data scientists, as well as those who are trying to get their foot into the door and for succeed, succeeding in this field? Uh, how can they find their way in this uh, field, which is like a vast sea? <laughs> Very good question. So first of all, I really enjoy this diversity and backgrounds in people that go into data science. When I was mm -hmm. teaching psychology, and the box approach. Exactly. When I was mm -hmm. when I was uh, teaching psychology and neuroscience only, you know, everybody was kind of like there was a much more restricted range of where people right. were co coming from. And there's nothing wrong with that, but I truly enjoy, you know, meeting all these people from all these different backgrounds. And by the way, mm -hmm. the backgrounds are usually math, computer science, engineering, some other science, uh, finance. Or finance, yes, or some, something really just random, like anything, mm -hmm. poetry, poetry. And I, I really, really enjoy that. Like, I, I find that, mm -hmm. I think that that is wonderful. However, as you just said, that is raising a challenge. Like, how are you going to bring everybody on the same page, right? And I think mm -hmm. uh, what I would tell people who are interested in going into this is embrace the fact that data science is something else that is not uh, your background. So a lot of people who come in from math they think this is just like math and, you know, they want to mm -hmm. see proof. And they want to see yeah, the elephant thing. Like the everyone, elephant. like people are blinded and then they touch yes. different parts of the elephant and then it's that's a drum. Exactly. It's yeah. that's exactly right. And so the math people are like, I need to see the derivation. I need to see the proof. And by the way, that's great. Uh, and um, we need to, we need the proof. It's necessary, but it's not sufficient. We, so as a math person, I would advise you be open to the fact that uh, you can't just stick with the proof and the derivation. 
Those are things that are necessary, but we need to go beyond that, right? Mm-hmm. And if you're not willing to open your mind to that, you should just go back to math, just, just, just math. The CS mm-hmm. person, right? The CS person wants to see the code, and they, want see, <laughs> they want to see the algorithm, and that's great. We need the code, we need, we need the algorithm, but same thing as the math person. If you just want to stick to that, you probably should just go back to just straight up CS. You need mm-hmm. to open the, your, the, your, yourself to the fact that, yeah, you need to understand the proof. Because data mm-hmm. science is both. The science person, right? This mm-hmm. is not a data analysis class or data analysis field. The algorithm does matter, particularly because everything is going to do have like, uh, you know, time or space complexity or memory complexity trade-offs. So you have to understand mm-hmm. that. And you, yes, you have to understand the proof too. So it's not just, right. saying, oh, I'm going to randomly analyze some data. No, no, no. The, the algorithm matters. And this is not just data analysis. Uh, the engineering person, yes, the outcomes matter. We want to, you know, <laughs> reduce the root mix for error by like 10% or something like that. But you should worry about, okay, how are we going to do that? Because the engineering mm-hmm. approach is like by any means necessary. But right. look, we want to do this in a principled fashion. We don't want to just screw around, right? Mm-hmm. And, and, and so actually the people who are literally come from a random field, actually usually are the most open to this. They, they don't have a strong prior that this is going to be. So I actually think they're mm-hmm. well, well positioned to take this in. So all I'm saying is if you want to come from one of those fields, uh, mm-hmm. if you want to succeed in data science, open your mind that data science is more than some of these parts. And if you're not willing to do that, then you should probably not do a data science. And that's not, no, there's nothing mm-hmm. wrong with that. Uh, if you just want to do math, just want to do CS, or just want to do science, you don't have to do data science. Mm-hmm. There's nothing wrong with that. But if you really want to do data science, and you have a mind that's broad enough to embrace that, you should mm-hmm. to run with that. It is an inherently Fox approach. And you mm-hmm. should, and so, but again, if you're not broad minded about this, it's not, it's, it's going to be really hard. So, so my, my advice would be welcome, but embrace mm-hmm. the fact that it's more than any of these component parts. Right, right, right. The sum is larger than the parts, basically. In data science, mm-hmm. definitely. And, and, that's, so, and, that, and that's what makes it, that's what makes it special and frankly, from mm-hmm. our career perspective, so valuable. There's like mm-hmm. you know right. millions of software engineers out there, and that's great. But genuine data scientists who can can integrate all these things is actually very rare, and that's what makes it very very well like lucrative from a, from mm-hmm. a, from a purely like mm, compensation perspective. Because right. you know any, anybody can can you know run some functions and but truly understand why you're doing that and why not something mm-hmm. else and understand the outputs. And by the way, as you know, I'm trying to teach that in my classes. We're like, no, you mm-hmm. have to like, not just run the function or write the function. Tell us what you think that means. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah. Right, right, right. So like the key to becoming a skilled data scientist is developing that mindset, yes. the right mindset. And from mm-hmm. the, I would say from the beginning. I see. About, uh, yeah, that makes sense. It's about the mindset, you're right. I see. Yeah, that, w- that was a great answer. Mm-hmm. And uh, what do you like personally uh, love the most about uh, the field of data science? And where do you think the future is headed? Well, two things. Um, <laughs> I, well, I mean, a lot of the things I love already came up. So, so one is that it is interdisciplinary inherently, that it mm-hmm. is more than just math or statistics or coding or mm-hmm. science. By the way, all the things which I like, but, but the sum is more than the sum right, of its parts. parts. Mm-hmm. Um, so I like all of that. I like that the people who go into it are have to be broad-minded. So I like to talk to them. It's all that's mm-hmm. all great. I like the fact that our that our that our world is going to the day into that, that direction. So it allows you to make a bigger impact. We already mentioned ethical data science. Um, and by the way, something I haven't mentioned yet. Uh, from mm-hmm. earliest childhood that I can remember, I've always loved numbers. Always, mm-hmm. always loved numbers. So. I, it's, I find it amazing that you can make a living doing that. And I've always loved science. So if numbers that represent something in the real world, like, oh my God, like, and you get paid to do that. That's amazing. I see. Yeah. Um, where it's going is that's up anyone's guess. Uh, my biggest concern switching mm-hmm. from psychology to data science was actually that psychology had been around for, you know, at this point, 150 years. It's yeah. going to be around, yes. Data science, mm-hmm. frankly, between you and me and everybody else who's listening, has never been through a recession. Oh yeah. no! Oh no! So so it might go away. It might die. I don't mm-hmm. think it will. Yeah. I don't think it will. I hope it doesn't. But it could. It has not mm-hmm. been. It hasn't been tested. It has not been tested. It has. Mm-hmm. So so psychology and at this point neuroscience has been tested. They have been around for a long time. Data science has not. Maybe mm-hmm. it's going to go away. I hope it doesn't. 
maybe I mean, I, and I don't think it will, but maybe it will. Uh, the second thing is uh, what I think is going to get much bigger in scale. So as you saw, while I was teaching the machine learning class in the spring, mm -hmm. DALI 2 came out, for instance. And I think that's mm -hmm. going to change the culture, like how we think about art. So I think right. data science is going to become much more infused and much more impactful than it already is in, in, in society. So basically, I think it's going to have the impact that CS already had. So basically, computer science ate the world, right? Like it changed our yeah. entire right. world called culture in the last 20 years. I think in the next 20 years, data science will have the impact. That's what I think is most likely outcome that mm -hmm. CS already had. Uh, the biggest danger I see is actually, from my personal perspective, that it's going to mm -hmm. specialize, that, that it's going to be, you know, machine learning as only one track or like, so basically, as you, as you know, data scientists have all these different hats, but that for like, um, it's going to like cluster into these different like subfields. From a Fox perspective, it would be tragic, yes, that, that yeah. Yeah, it's like going to splinter in all these different fields. It might specialize. I think it could go in that direction. That's what all, all the other fields have been doing so for instance if you're a psychologist you're not just a psychologist you're like a environmental psychologist or a mm -hmm. psychologist or a social psychologist or a personality psychologist or a biological psychologist or whatever right. cognitive psychologist so mm -hmm. there will be realistically some kind of specialization right so that's, that's my prediction it's going to increase in in scale and impact it will also specialize that's because that's what all the other fields have been doing uh but the danger is that's not going to do any of that because uh, it's just going to fall apart as mm -hmm. soon as we encounter the first serious recession, but I hope, yeah. but I don't think, it, but I don't think it will. But I'm mindful for the possibility. It's like a black swan kind of thing. Right, right, right. Yeah, that makes yeah, that's a good way to put it, and um, that totally makes sense. Like the threats that you mentioned and the way it's going to be in the future. Yeah, and then you. Uh, so this is my last question for today. So uh, you like to try different things, as we already discussed. So uh, this kind of a personal question. Like, what do you find most rewarding? Uh, is it teaching? Is it research? Or is it something else? And like, where do you see yourself, let's say, 20 years down the line? Uh, what what would you be doing? Like, what can the <laughs> students expect you to be doing? Okay, so 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 let's say, those are, that's, that's, all, that's a great question. So just briefly, um, what I find rewarding, uh, I love teaching, as you probably mm -hmm. know. But I also love research. So they are somewhat intentional because to do both well, you have to spend a lot of time on it. I think it's not either or, it's just that the time scales of the reward in teaching and uh, research are very different. So for instance, in teaching, you have to bring it every day. Every time you show up, you have to bring it, yes? Yeah, and a game, yeah. You have to bring your A game every time you, sh you show up. And if you don't bring it, the students will let you know. They will not give you credit mm -hmm. for what you did a year ago or two years ago. Now you have to bring it every time. And I that's, agree. But I find that's very rewarding. Uh, so basically... Like, like you just said, so, so meeting students like you or the other students, I find it very rewarding um, about teaching that you, you can see that, you know, what you're doing maybe inspires them to do, you know, mm -hmm. whatever they're going to be doing. So, so that, that I find very rewarding. In research, you know, you also have an impact, ideally. It's just that it's, it might take five years to do that. Mm -hmm. so, so if you do a research right. project, that is the, 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 the impact or the progress there is measured in years. I mean, between thinking of the project doing the research, analyzing data, publishing the paper, seeing the impact of the paper, easily you're looking at five years before you see mm -hmm. the actual, like, you know, so from a, from a reward, you know, reinforcement learning perspective, if these huge delays, and it's also very right. sparse, very sparse rewards. So, right. so, so you have to kind of play the long game there. But I like to like, I like to do both, but you have to be mindful if you do that, that in teaching both the rewards and the, you know, punishments, frankly, like the negative rewards, if, if you don't do well, they're coming immediately. Whereas right. in, in, in research, it's going to be much longer. Fra so frankly, um, what shall I call it? Uh, so that's what, that's what motivates me, like uh, to, to make mm -hmm. it. So that goes to my, to, my, to my, so it's not just like, hey, I want to make 200K, 300K to work for a company. Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with that, by the way, to do that. It's just mm -hmm. not what, what motivates me. I see, yeah. Um, so if you were into money, do that. It's a great way to have <laughs> leverage data science. Mm -hmm. but, but so in terms of like uh, 20 years, so here's the thing. So as I just said, I would like to make an impact or I'd like to make a, 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 like some kind of impact. Mm -hmm. And I would say in the next 20 years, I would like to make a bigger impact. So mm -hmm. I would like, so for instance, to write more 
textbooks, for instance, for like data science. Because I think there's a, a need for that. The field is sure. so young, so young that there's not really a good like comprehensive single comp resource. Exactly. So the the Bible of data science right. has the Bible. Not, yeah, you said it. Has, yeah. Not, has not been written yet. Yes. Correct. So I would like to make a bigger impact there. But in terms of specific about what I'll be doing, I'll give you a cautionary tale. If you mm -hmm. told me 20 years ago that, Pascal, you're going to be in, in the US, <laughs> or let's say 25 years, because in 20 years I was already here, but 25 years ago, <laughs> you're going to be in the US, you're going to be uh, in New York. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you're at NYU. Be, at NYU, you're first going to be doing psychology and then, and then data science, which didn't exist back then. I was like, none of those things are going to happen. And, mm -hmm. and, but they did. So, so, right. so, my, so my honest answer would be 20 years is such a long time. And people underestimate this. I research researching this psychologically that mm -hmm. people underestimate or say they overestimate how much, how much difference one year will make, but they mm -hmm. all underestimate how much, how transformational 10 years is going to be. And 10, right. five or 10 years is, is enough time to completely reinvent yourself completely. And so yeah. uh, I think a fair answer would be that it's unknowable what mm -hmm. I'll be doing in 20 years. Because I if you told me the things that actually happened about 20 years ago, I'd be like, like I said, 25 years ago, I was like, I'm not going to be new in the US. I'm not going to be mm -hmm. new. And 20 years yeah. ago, data science didn't even exist yet. So, that makes sense, yeah. So, so I would have been like, yeah, no. That uh, seems very unlikely. And, but it happened. Mm -hmm. So I guess my, my answer would be, I want to make a bigger impact and I hope I'll find mm -hmm. a way to do that. But what that For will sure. be specifically, I have absolutely, I mean, I, I mean, I have some ideas, but, but it's unknowable. Mm -hmm. I see. Yeah, uh, that totally makes sense. Like those are like fair points. And uh, yeah, that was a great answer. Like, uh, even if you don't know, like that's totally valid. Like uh, 20 years is like a huge span. And like, hopefully yeah. it, will, it will be something that will be useful to somebody, like uh, mm -hmm. helps them in their journey. Uh, that'll be, that'll be, that'll be a good outcome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great um desire to have um yeah and i said that that was my last question but i have a real quick last question so uh this is your thursday outfit i think so what is it about yes. your outfit so max specifically asked me to ask you that you have a outfit set for each day right so True. uh would you like to talk a bit about it yes yeah, so i have a dress code yeah and uh i actually have that in my city well, for the undergrads at least uh, uh -huh. that, that Monday is red, Tuesday is green, Wednesday is yellow, Thursday, so today is is, mm -hmm. uh, blue. is blue, and Friday is, is white. And yeah, so basically, if you see me on the street, uh, you can decode from uh, the color of the shirt what, what day it is. Or when, if someone someone watches this you know, in the future, this, this recording, they will know this was yeah. done on a, on a Thursday. Right. And so, so there's two, two reasons for this. The first one is purely like uh, synesthesia. So basically... Something like five percent of the population have synesthesia. Where basically, they map um, um, concepts to colors or concepts to each other. So, for instance, most people or most people who have that, if they close their eyes and think of the of the um, uh, letter A or the number four, they map that to the color red. And I mm -hmm. maps onto one, maps to white, and two maps to green, maps to N. By the way, if you want to know why this mapping happens, is it, it at least in the U.S. It has been mm -hmm. linked by, actually by a color vision scientist at NYU, which I'll happy to share that paper. You can share mm -hmm. your show notes to a popular fridge magnet set that was sold in the US uh, mm -hmm. for a long time. So basically the, the, those fridge magnets have that color. So the A is red and the uh, two is green. So basically it was that early, early childhood association. Again, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and uh, so, and I have that very strongly and I associate okay. these, these days with that. And so, that is one of the perks of being in academia. So as, as if you're in a, like in a corporation, you, you know, I don't know, there's a dress code, right? You should wear a suit or something like that. But I, being mm -hmm. a professor, can do whatever I want, right? So yeah. I let it all hang out, yes. The second right. thing is I actually use that in teaching. So for instance, I, you know, a couple of years ago, I was teaching a, sig a signal processing class, yes. Mm -hmm. But that class only met once a week. <laughs> so <laughs> I, was, I was undersampling my true you know, time course, my time series. Right. So I asked the students, you probably think I always were, I think it was, a Tuesday, it was Tuesday class, <laughs> you think I always wear green, but you're just, you're just undersampling the signal. It's the real signal changes much faster. So yeah, I use right. it in teaching as like a prop for like six oh. signal processing, yes. So right. time, time series analysis, yes. Right. 
Yes. That's amazing. That's amazing. That was like really uh, interesting to know about your uh, rationale behind doing that. And yeah, that was really great. Totally awesome. Thank you. <laughs> You're very kind. And so thank you for thank you for doing this. Hopefully it was useful. It will be useful to somebody or interesting. And um, yeah, I'm not going to say any time because I'm busy. As you, as you mm -hmm. said, it took a long time to set up. It's true. But, but yeah, happy to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much for doing this. I'm very sure that uh, your experiences and the knowledge that you shared is going to be helpful for all my viewers. And mm -hmm. I totally appreciate you being candid and honest uh, with your responses. That will definitely uh, oh. help all the viewers. I hope so. And I uh, totally appreciate it. Thank you very much for taking your time again. And thank you very much to all the viewers for watching this. If you are new to my channel, then hit that subscribe button. I have a lot of future videos uh, lined up for you and uh, stay tuned for them. And thank you. See you all in the next one.